going to be a real quick shoot about uh, one of the alleged pilot hijackers of, of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. And Ziad Samir Jara figured since Israel is now taking center stage on the international and domestic platforms of all viral media and media, figure why not? Let's take advantage, right? And when you realize, well, what does Israel have to do with Ziad Jara? Well, that's a good question. Probably nothing. Or maybe there is something. So I've done a couple of videos on Ziad Jar and his family with ties to Israeli and foreign intelligence. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit here. But um, you could just look at the search bar and look up uh, stories like Ziad Jar doesn't fit the profile. I did a video about that. Um, or the family intelligence into Ziad Jar. Um, but yeah, I've done a couple of videos. And so has DJ Thurman Detonator. In fact, there's very few people, if any at all, that talk about Ziad Jar at all or the uh, connection to Israeli intelligence. I think it's worth something to look into, don't you? I mean, nobody talks about this stuff. Why not? Why not? Well, what do we know about Ziad Jar? Well, I'll, I'll give you the brief rundown. Look, he was born in Lebanon in... Uh, 1975, uh, Becca Valley. Um, he went to Christian schools. He was brought up with no religious training. His uh, um, he was the only son in the uh, in the household. Um, Actually, at a very young age, he wanted to fly. And his father told him that because I only have one son, I dissuaded him for, from it because I was afraid he would get into an accident and crash. How about that for irony? <laughs> right? So, at the age of 19, in 1996, Ziad Jara actually leaves Lebanon, moves to Germany with his cousin, Salim al -Jara. In uh, April of 96, they rent a room together, they rent an apartment. Now, this is really important because from this point forward, Ziad Jarrah never lives with anybody else ever in his whole life. Short life. This is the only time, besides growing up in Lebanon, that he actually lived with somebody, but he lives with a family member. Ziad Jarrah then goes and travels and goes to Greasewald University to study um, medicine and learn German. A few weeks later, after going out, living a singles lifestyle with Salim, just like he did in Lebanon, all of a sudden, in just a few short weeks, less than a month, he visits the local mosque. Greasewald Mosque. He meets an individual named Abdul Rahman al Makadi, a known Salafi uh, preacher uh, with connections to Hamas. He would do fundraising activities for the Palestinian group of Hamas. The German intelligence, the BFV, knew about Rahman al Makadi. And Makadi would show him around. Bring him with connections to local militants in these mosques, because they were radical mosques, teaching Wahhabism, which is a ultra-Orthodox sect of Islam that comes from Saudi Arabia. Nevertheless, in September of 97, Ziad Jarrah actually leaves his cousin and moves into a room, rents a room from a German woman in Hamburg. He switches schools, goes to the University of Applied Sciences, and studies aeronautical engineering. So, from this point forward, Makati shows, tells him about a mosque in Hamburg called Al-Quds, which is run by a even more militant preacher there, named Muhammad Fazazi, who used to give these wildly 
radical sermons about destroying the United States, Israel, that you should kill Jews. Um, and this attracted the the ignorance, right? The um, the illiterates of the Quran, the illiterates themselves, they don't know how to read many of these people. Anyway, but these were educated people going here. People like Muhammad Atta, the alleged pilot hijacker of Flight 11. Marwan al Shahi, the alleged hijacker of United Airlines Flight 175. Ramzi bin al Shib. Munir al Muntasdek and Saeed Bahaji. These were considered the hardcore members of Al Quds. They would stay late at night after. The regulars would go home, visitors to the mosque, and Fazazi would begin preaching the, the Salafi branch of Islam, the Wahhabi form. Right? They would stay at night, learn from him. But then Ziad Jara, who would go to this mosque, under the direction of al-Makadi, was also introduced to another person. And he goes by this name. This is the only public record of this man. Marcel Hussein K. And I'm talking about, really, the only people ever to talk about this guy was Paul Thompson, who I consider the best 9-11 researcher in the world. And of course, Der Spiegel, which is the most underutilized publication regarding 9-11 and activities after 9-11. It's a German publication. Right there with Florida Bulldog. Right? So, Marcel Hussein K., who's known to be a militant and the head imam at the um, I forgot the name of the mosque that he was in, West Rafalia, West Rafalia mosque. Uh, Marcel Hussein, this person will become so intertwined with Ziyad Jara's rest of his life that Ziyad Jara even called him just days before the night level death, according to intelligence. Now, he would only call Marcel Page the problem. Something supports him. Maybe a meeting, maybe a problem. He would call this game. And there's so few information about this. Who the hell is this? Same for Abdul Rahman Al Makad. Who the hell is that? How is it that the FBI doesn't mention any of these people? They only mention the hundreds. That's only because, according to the German PFU, there is very little information regarding any connection between Ziad Jara and Al Quds Now, in an order by the Los Angeles Times, I'm going to quote it. This is what the German BFP said about Ziad Jara. Quote. The only information we have connected to the three Hamburg suspects, Muhammad Atta, Marwan al Shay, and Ziad Jara, is the FBI's assertion that there is a connection to the high ranking police source of the investigation. Sure. We have come across absolutely no evidence of our own. End quote. Now, the only link to Ziad Jara to Hamburg cell is a single wedding photo from Saeed Bahadi's wedding in 1999. And that came from federal prosecutor King Neem, who disclosed the first bit of the connection, and he alluded to having a photo showing Ziajar at the wedding, which came from an informant inside the mosque. Ziajar will call his family for his monthly stipend once in a while. 
found out that he was going through a radical response, and they couldn't believe it. Here's a kid with no religious training, no religious upbringing, especially in Islam, he told he was a Muslim. Um, he was friends with Lebanese Christians, grew up in Beirut, which sold to uh, a large population of Lebanese Christians. Um, makes the move to Germany in 96, all of a sudden starts going to these mosques, meeting these militants out of nowhere. Goes to the most radical mosque in all of Hamburg, the al -Quds. Why? Why? Why does he do this? Why does he make this jump? Why does he jump from studying applied uh, medicine to applied sciences in, in aeronautical engineering? Maybe because he wanted to live his dream. He wanted to be a pilot, incidentally enough. In December of 99, here's another interesting note. According to the FBI at the time in 2003-2004, a person by the name of Muhammadu Aul Slahi meets with Muhammad Atta, Mawad al Shay, Ramzi bin al Shib, and tells him to go to Afghanistan. Now, there's another story where Slahi uh, meets with Ramzi bin al Shib for one day and he stays with him, tells him about Afghanistan. This is Sly is supposed to be the connection between members of the Hamburg cell go to Africa. This is huge. Because now we know that Muhammad Al Sly, who I've interviewed on my show, was found in of all charges. Now, this is tremendous because now you've lost a connection between the Hamburg cell and Afghanistan, where it's alleged that when to Afghanistan, they met with who? The lower ranking Al Qaeda members? No. They met Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Dr. Ayman al Zawahari, Mohammed Atef, and Osama bin Laden, the three highest ranking members of Al Qaeda. At the time, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was not Al Qaeda until a little bit later. So it's, it's incredible that these young kids go to Afghanistan, stay there for two weeks. Security clearance, you know, this Al Qaeda does security clearance on the backgrounds, right? They pass. They find that Zia Jara, Malamashe, and Zia Jara were clear. And they're recruited for this operation called the Plains Operation, which was created by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Because before this, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had met with Osama bin Laden, Mohammed Atef, and told about this operation that was supposed to be the Bajinka plot, in which they wanted to hijack 10 planes, crashed them all over the United States. These guys are recruited. Mom and, I, and according to, again, the public record, bin Laden selected four planes. And Zia Jar, Muhammad Ashi, and Muhammad Atta were, were considered the pilots. Incidentally enough, before he met these three, he met Khalid, Khalid Amidor and Wapa Hadli, who were the first to be recruited into planes operation. And they were supposed to be the pilots, but they didn't learn English. That's for another story. Anyway. So while there, Atta, Al Shib, Muhammad Al Shib, and Zia Jar swear by at loyalty to bin Laden. And that's how they joined Al Qaeda. That's all you need. You, you When you join Al-Qaeda, you swear by loyalty to bin Laden first. Then you go to these training camps. You may go to al Farouk. You may go to Farms. Jump the ball. But I think the whole wall time wasn't functional. But al on our was. And they, you know, they, they have different training methods. One is guerrilla warfare. One's for um, logistical planning. Uh, another is for, like, small arms fire tank fire, large munitions fire, building bombs, whatnot. It's also the only time where Zia Jar is in a video with Muhammad Atta and Tariq Farms. I had this uploaded to Odyssey because uh, I couldn't upload it to YouTube because they considered it uh, 
posting Islamist material. I got a strike for it. So I can't upload it, but it's on Odyssey. But it has no sound. In the video, they're going over Ziad Jara's will because Ziad Jara did a video will. So did Muhammad Atta. Later on, Ziad Jara would do a martyrdom will. But that didn't get published because he was laughing, seen joking in it. Almost like trying to fit in at this point. It's what it seems like. I can't prove it. It just seems like. Ziad Jara, after Afghanistan, goes back to Germany, moves to the United States, Florida. Right in a zone. Muhammad Atta, who is first, goes with Mawan al Shehi, rented a apartment together. Zajar comes later. They take flight lessons at flight schools. Zajar goes to um, Florida Training Center. Gets his license, commercial license. Same thing for Muhammad Atta Mohan al -Shahi. But what's interesting enough is that before he comes to the United States, Ziad Jara travels to Dubai. And there are some reports at this time that he's already on a, a terrorist watch list. And it's not known why he was put on this list. And the only information about this comes from accounts as to why Jara is stopped and questioned by immigration officials at the United Arab Emirates in Dubai on January 30th, 1999. Because he goes to Afghanistan in January, and then he goes again to in the summer of 99, June, July. He stopped at the United Arab Emirates again in the summer of 99. Dubai sees he has a passport from Afghanistan. Now, usually what you do is at the training schools in Al Farouk or Tarnay Farms, they give you fake passports because Afghanistan was known as a terrorist sympathizing country. They knew that Al Qaeda training camps were there, Taliban training camps, it was put on the terrorist watch list globally. Interpol made it known to any connecting Arab country to run the passports through customs, through Interpol, to see if there's any Afghanis going to other countries because they, they would track them. So Ziad Jara actually kept his passport from Afghanistan. Well, Atta and Marwan al Shay didn't. They traveled with fake ones. Ziad Jara did. It's almost like at this point, there's like a connection, right? He's trying to play the part of terrorist. Hey, I'm going to a terrorist training camp in Afghanistan. I'm traveling to Dubai. Because they see the stamps, the, the, the stamps on the, the passport. So what do they do? They call the CIA because he's going to the United States. What made him more incriminating was that there was an Al-Qaeda stamp and he was carrying Al-Qaeda manuals in his luggage, almost like saying, hey, look, I'm Al-Qaeda. Of course, Dubai says, oh, we're calling the CIA. Hey, he's coming to the United States. What did the CIA tell Dubai authorities? Let him through. Let him through. Just like when Khalid Amidon and Wapahadvi were coming from an Al-Qaeda meeting in Malaysia in December of 99 to the United States in January 2000, they let him through. Ziad Jara coming from Afghanistan with Al Qaeda uh, stamps on the passport, let him through. Why? Because Ziad Jara is actually being monitored by the CIA. It's 
stays in the United States, stays in Florida, rents a room, travels around the United States by himself. He's the only hijacker in this whole thing that lives on his own, that is on his own. He's part of the operation, but he's on his own. It's really got to make you think now, wow. There's more mystery to this guy than any of the other hijackers. We can't prove anything. We don't have specifics now. The technical details. It very well could have been somebody recruited in this operation that he flew Flight 93, crashed in Shanksville, that he lived on his own because he liked to be on his own. whose family had intelligence backgrounds with Israel and foreign intelligence in Syria and Libya. That's just coincidental. But on the other hand, what I'm trying to do is make you think in the other direction, but being careful about it. Speculation. That's all this is. Now, the people in Florida at the flight training school, they're like, they love the Ajar. He was a fun-loving guy. Didn't seem like a radical fundamentalist, although they had to play the part as a nice Western young man who's coming to just learn about flight training. Then he goes to Portman Aviation, where in the 9-11 Commission report, it stated, quote, on at least one occasion, when Ziad Jara attends Hortman Aviation, he's accompanied by another man who he introduces as his uncle. Who has a darker complexion than Ziad Jara. And that this man was described as being average height, late 40s, appropriately dressed, and doesn't appear to be an immigrant to the United States. Because now he doesn't know if he speaks English because Jared does all the talking. Whoever this was, I don't know. Was it his actual uncle, which would be Asim al Jara? Or was it his cousin, Ali al Jara? We're going to get to that in a minute why I mentioned these names. Zia Jara meets with the muscle hijackers of Florida. They go to Maryland. He rents a room for himself, rents a room for them. Then go to Newark, New Jersey, to the Days Inn Motel. Two days before September 11, 2001, he rents a room for himself. He rents a room for them. The three muscle hijackers are Mustafa al Hasawi, Ahmed al Nami, and Saeed al Gam. You would think in the two days prior to 9-11, you would want to be with the Muslim hijackers to still coordinate with them about the proper methods of what's going to happen on the plane. At no point was he ever with them. He's seen with them, yes. He doesn't rent room. For, I mean, that's the red flags have to be going up here. Court to the 9-11 Commission in the morning, very early morning hours of September 11th, Ziad Jara phones his girlfriend an hour before he boards Flight 93. Now, here's the thing. The FBI doesn't know whether the phone calls came from the Days Inn Motel or at the airport. How could they not tell? Two specific different phone numbers. If he stayed at the Days in Motel, that means he used the phone. If he used the phone, the FBI would basically trace any calls from that phone to whoever he was calling. If not, then that meant he would call from the airport, right? I mean, it, am I wrong? Well, Ziajar called his girlfriend, Ezo Sanguine, and basically tells him that she loves him three times. And he hungs up. She was at a dentist, couldn't talk. 
Flight 93 takes off. Now, there's a lot of phone calls made on this plane, more so than any other plane. Six calls made from Flight 93 stated that they only saw three hijackers, not four, as stated by the FBI 9-11 Commission. Mark Baker makes a call to his mother, Alice Hoagland, saying, I'm flying from Newark to San Francisco and calling from the air phone. The plane's been taken over by three guys. Miklick, who's on Flight 93, calls his wife and tells her there are three hijackers who put on red headbands. They stood up, yelled, and ran into the cockpit. Three guys. This is before anybody went to the cockpit. But said, well, maybe Ziajar went to the cockpit after the three guys took over the cockpit. No, it's not the case. C.C. Lyles, who's a flight attendant, called her husband, who wasn't there to receive the call at first, said, there are three guys hijacking a plane. Todd Beamer calls uh, American Airlines and the GT phone operator who's trying to connect them, Lisa Jefferson, heard what Tom Beamer told him. He goes, she told, he tells her, um, well, she relates the call saying that Tom Beamer called me and said there are three people. Aha, uh -huh. we can't rule them out. Why? Because we have the audio, cockpit audio recording of Zia Jara announcing to the plane that everybody should sit down, that he's the captain of the plane. Well, that's who's making that recording. Is it Zia Jara? Is he on the plane? But if you listen to the audio of that of that of Ziajara, there's a weird sound, like a droning, like an on in the background when he's saying it. I don't know what that is, but anyway, he makes the announcement twice. Ziajara's boarding pass is acknowledged by the flight gate attendant. The FBI did collect that information; they got it. So he's a, he got on the plane. But did he get off before that? It's a theory I, I still propose. Now, I didn't dismiss Ziajar be on the plane. Like I said, he, he there is two, dead, two audio recordings of it. Yeah, that's the end of the story. Yeah, Nice kid, recruited by Islamists in Germany, comes part of the 9 11 operation. However, seven years later, on July 12, 2008, his cousin, Ali Al Jara, that I mentioned, is arrested by Hezbollah authorities. He's uh, handed over to Lebanese military professionals and he relates to them that he's been an Israeli Mossad spy for 30 years. That he was paid over $300,000 over the years by Israeli intelligence. In fact, he had two uh, rental apartments, one for his girlfriend, one for his family. His brother, Yusuf Al-Jara, 
is said to have helped him in this uh, operation for 10 years. have work in intelligence, but his family knew he did. But he was also a member of the Abu Nadal organization. That's how far back this guy went. That wasn't an incriminating piece of evidence. They also found a business card. And it belonged to Asim al -Jara. The same uncle who said to Der Spiegel, to foreign media, that he had not seen Ziajar since 1994. On the back of that business card is an address to a house of 54 Marian Strang, the same apartment that was rented by Ramzi Ben Ashib, Muhammad Atta, Mohan Al Shehi and visited by Muhammad Haydar Zamar and Mark Moon Darkanzali. And what's interesting about all this is that here's a kid who grew up secular, was friends with Christians, was a party goer, liked women, moved to Germany, and in short time, became a radical fundamentalist who had connections with the Islamist underworld in Germany and in Hamburg, and meets with members of the planes operation. Mohammed Atta Mohan al goes to the most radical fundamentalist mosque and then changes careers from medicine to forensic aviation uh, to um, goes to the University of Applied Sciences and studies aeronautical engineering, meets with individuals like Abdul Rahman al makadi and Marcel Hussein K, who introduces them to the radical mosque in Al-Quds, who then, uh, then goes to Afghanistan and meets with Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and becomes recruited for the planes operation. He then lives alone never seen with anybody, becomes a radical fundamentalist, joins Al-Qaeda, gets on Flight 93, and crashes into Shanksville. His family has in, in, deep intelligence ties with Israel, Libya, Syria, Germany, and Al-Qaeda doesn't pick this up. Supposedly, this is the end of the story. But yet, it's a story that's not known to many people. That's why I did this short shoot on Ziajar, just to bring attention to this very interesting story, which I hope 
will gain steam one day and people start talking about it because what I think Ziad Jara was is my opinion. There's no evidence. Is that Ziad Jara was an Israeli mole inside the plane's operation to make sure that this operation went smoothly and was successful in order for Israel to benefit from the attacks on 9-11. And they did. They did. I'm not saying everybody in the Israeli government knew about this. They probably did. In fact, it was a very small group. Very small. Just like the President of the United States didn't know about specifics for 9-11, because you don't want that guy in front of a camera. He's retarded. Just like you didn't want the President of Israel or the Prime Minister of Israel knowing too much specifics. Well, there we go. What an interesting story of Ziad Samir Jara. And um, hopefully uh, this video was very uh, educational for you. And um, of course, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.